rejoicing and being glad in it. If you can, will you stand up to your feet? We are just going to exalt the name of the Lord. We're going to bless him. We're going to join in with all heaven and lift his name on today. We're going to introduce a new song, but I think it'll be easy enough for uh, us for all to catch it together. Is that all right? Come on, put your hands together like this. Whether you're here or you're joining us at home, we're so glad that you're here. Come on, magnify the Lord with us. Bless the Lord, oh mighty ones. Bless the Lord, you heavenly host. Bless the Lord, all you his angels. And let all the earth sing forth his praise.
Can you sing that? Let me hear you say. doing today who's excited to be in church today man I'm looking out I see so many beautiful people here if you're well if you're joining us online we want to welcome you to today's service can I just say this I me and my family maybe you've heard me say this before maybe you haven't but we moved here about six months ago and I noticed something this week I noticed that Chicago land doesn't believe in spring it's like extremely cold then Pastor Steve you didn't you didn't tell me that you know, I, I appreciate hoodie weather, and now all my hoodies are are just hanging somewhere. But today's a beautiful day, because today we get to make much of the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for, for all that God has in store for us today. Here's another reason why I'm excited. Today is step one. Look to your neighbor real quick. Say, today is step one. Now, what in the world is step one, Celeste? What in the world is step one? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what step one is. Step one is the place you go to after service if you love to get something to eat. Now, I, I'm not lying. There's some other things we do in step one. It's also the place where you get to find out more about us as a church, and we get to find out more about you. It's the place where you come and you get a free gift. It's the place where you come and you find out about ways to get connected, ways to join community, ways to join team. And I would love, 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 love if you would give me the, the privilege and the opportunity to get to know you just a little bit better and it all happens after today's service so maybe you're here it's not your first time but you've been asking yourself how do I get involved step one that's your that's your next step maybe you're here and it is your first time and you're like um, I want to know what we believe at this church step one that's your next step and maybe you're with someone that you brought for the very first time your next step is to get them to step don't leave me hanging there. Your next step is to get them to step one. There you go. I knew you had my back. So I'm so excited for that. I'm also really excited because I know God wants to meet us today. I know he has a special word for us today. I know that he wants us to experience his presence right here in the service right now. So the team's about to jump back into service. But before we do, can you do me a favor? Can you raise up your own hands? Can you sing your own songs to Jesus right now? Come on, team. Would you lead us? song to you and we call on your name because it's the highest name it's the greatest name there's no other name that we can be saved by and in no other name can we be hidden safe hallelujah so we hide in you God and we make your name great today
covered every sin. He has made provision to heal every broken heart. And no matter what we're going through, where you find yourself today, know that you are not walking it alone. And that he causes all things, not some things, but all things to work together for our good.
that somehow you are working on. some of us are grieving some of us are lost as to which direction to turn some of us has been told no some of us have been diagnosed some of us have children that we're praying for and we don't yet see the fruits <laughs> God help us in moments like these, God, when night is its darkest, when the weight is its heaviest, when the way is its cloudiest, God, to believe what you've already spoken, that because you love us, because you are enamored with us, <laughs> because your heart has not changed concerning us, <laughs> that you are working. <laughs> you are working. <laughs> Give us grace to trust you more. You are working. Give us grace to trust you more. God, so that in the midst of whatever it is that we can declare and with confidence and with faith that you have given us to know that you are working all things together for our good. Mm. It may not feel good. It may not even look good. But God, in your sovereignty <laughs> and in your master plan, it's working for our good. It's working for our good, God. And that's why we trust you. That's why we love you, God. And that's why in moments like this, God, where we are hurting, we can say, God, you are still worthy. You are still deserving because you are at work in our lives. <laughs> hmm. So, God, we thank you for the strength for the joy, for the peace that comes in your presence. God, that even though we brought to this altar that we've made, we brought those concerns and cares of our hearts, God, that we can cast them on you and you are big enough, you are strong enough, you are wise enough <laughs> to carry them and hold them all, and that we leave this place not the same way we came, but leaving with an assurance <laughs> that you are in control and that you hold our worlds, every detail in the palm of your hand. God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for your comfort. We thank you for your love, God. May we continue to experience the outpour of your love, not just in this service, God, but as we go throughout the rest of this week, God, that we'll be reminded of this moment where you reminded us that you love us and you are yet working. And we seal this moment in your mighty name. In Jesus' name we pray. We say thank you and amen. Someone say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is working. It is working. Can you encourage the person next to you and say, it is working? Because he's working it. Hallelujah. <laughs> you may have your seats.
welcome to church this morning. Every Sunday at New City, you can expect a powerful time of worship, a message from God's word, and an invitation to take steps toward experiencing a new life, a new way, and a new purpose through Jesus. Our heart is for people, so if you're joining us for the first time, we would love to get to know you. If you're here in person, don't forget to stop by the Connect Corner out in the lobby after service, and if you're joining us online, you can connect with any of our online hosts. Our team would love to give you a special gift, answer any questions you have, and introduce you to the people and purpose of New City Church. Are you looking to build friendships and grow in your faith here at New City? Well, we want to give you that opportunity with step one today, right after service. Step one is a personal interactive session where you can meet our ministry team, explore ways to get involved, and find your fit here at New City. Whether you are new to our church or just looking for the right place to fit in, step one is for you. Child care and lunch is on us. We've taken care of the details, so the only thing left for you to do is join us and encourage a friend to come with you. Junior high and high school students, we have two youth nights in the month of May, and our first one is tonight. Our next one is on May 22nd. We will meet at 7 p.m. here on the campus of North Central College. You can look forward to free food, live worship, and an epic giveaway. This is a great place to have fun, make new friends, and deepen your faith. For more information, go to newcity.life. School is almost out and graduations are right around the corner. If you are a graduate from eighth grade, high school, college, or higher education, we wanna know and we wanna celebrate you on June 5th during our 10 a.m. service. You or your parents can go to our website to find a registration link with more information on how you can get in on this moment. You deserve to be celebrated. As we gear up for a fun and busy summer, we wanna thank you for your commitment to the ministry and mission of New City Church. Every week at New City is another miracle of provision and it happens because of the faithful giving of God's people. From teenagers to single parents, grandparents to working professionals, the Bible is clear that as we all do our part in obeying the Lord and bringing our tithe and offering, God will take care of all of our needs and make us a blessing to others. There are three easy and simple ways for you to give to New City and support this work. You can give through our app, on our website, or by texting a dollar amount to the number at the bottom of the screen. Thank you, New City, for your generosity. Whatever you are walking through today, God has your back. Let's open our hearts to hear from him now. We love you, New City, and we're so glad you're here. Have a great Sunday. That's the start of it today is the beginning of a new series called We Are. And if you're excited about summertime, make some noise, would you please? And just like Pastor Joaquin said in Chicago, we like to go straight into summer. From winter to summer. Let's do that. 50, 45, rainy, all the way to 95. That's what we just did. It's great. I love it. I'm not complaining, honestly, Lord. Um, it's exciting for me because this is a moment, I think, where we get to really um, refocus, recalibrate, and consider who we are um, individually, but also as a community together, as a church together. When you build, um, actually, this is, this is something that I learned. I don't remember where I picked this up, but there's a lot of little uh, facts that, you know, you never know. They're, they're, they're facts to me that could be questionable because I read them somewhere. But you could, you could fact check me on this. I think that the limitation right now to most skyscrapers is really not obviously how tall they can build the building, but how deep they can go in the foundation. Because obviously we don't want to have that thing go uh, any higher and then accidentally fall over. That would be a bummer for everybody. So um, there are some buildings that have recently been built that whose foundations weren't set correctly and they're trying to figure out how do you take a fully grown skyscraper, 
and, and tilt it back, you know, like get it back to where it's supposed to be. So this is what I want to talk about today. This series for the next few weeks, we're going to be digging down deep to find what are the bedrock principles, what are the things that, that we're building ourselves on as a church so that we can kind of go into this next season confident of that and even for you guys so that I can encourage you and challenge you to grab a hold of these same things in your personal life and to reflect them in your own family, in your own home, in your own personal commitments um, as just as much as we do as a church. So I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to read our text for today. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to one of, her, one of his earliest letters speaking to a group of believers in a very cosmopolitan city called Corinth. He says this to them. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with superior, superiority of speech or eloquence or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear, and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray you would add your blessing, your anointing, to the reading and the hearing of your word today. We pray, God, that you would open our hearts to receive it and respond to it in obedience and in faith today. I ask blessing on all your people who are gathered here in this place, online. Lord, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Okay, before you're seated, say this. Jesus. Oh, boy. I'm going to try that again. Say it loud. Say, Jesus is our message. You can be seated. I love books. And uh, I, I, I used to, back in the day, frequent a lot of bookstores. Um, and those, for you kids, were a place where you could go to buy books. Um, but I used to go to these used bookstores because there were many books that as a, as a pastor, as a Christian, that had gone out of print but were still real gems. And I got this, I, I learned a trick from one of my mentors. He would tell me this because he, he had a library much bigger than mine, and, or he has a library much bigger than mine, and, and it just was, I would always be like, where did you find that book? It's so good. How did you, how did you find that? And, and, and his trick was this. He said, when I go to these bookstores, I, I, I learned this thing. All the treasures are found on the bottom shelf because nobody wants to go through all that trouble to get down low enough. You now, these used bookstores, you know, they're not usually like a... Um, you know, they're not like a Barnes and Noble type of affair, right? It's usually just a, you know, like a strip mall sort of spot, you know, and the books are everywhere. And he said, you get down low because nobody looks through that and picks through those books on the bottom shelf. And, it, it, you know, you could go top shelf and you're gonna, you, it's all going to be picked through. But you go bottom shelf and that's where you find the treasures. I read that when they were building... Many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago at, at Harvard, they were building a place called Emerson Hall. It was for the philosophy department at Harvard. And the president at the, at the time was named Charles Eliot. He was a believer. He, he invited American psychologist, uh, an American psychologist named William James, very famous at the time, to come to campus and to be in a conversation with him and to suggest basically for the philosophy building what they should ascribe to the building, right? What they should write there over the, the, the main entrance to the building. And William James had this, he, he had this idea, and he quoted Pythagoras, right, who you guys know as this Greek guy. He said, uh, Pythagoras said, man is the measure of all things. And remember the Pythagorean theorem, isn't that cool how he said man is the measure? He's, he, even, he, even, he even had puns going on, right, Pythagoras did. Okay, um, and so this is what William James said. Hey, write this above the door. Man is the measure of all things. And so President Eliot never contacted James again. And the morning after the scaffolding down came, uh, came down over the building, above the entrance at Emerson Hall are the words of Psalm 8-4. They're still there today. Who is man that you are mindful of him? You see, William James wanted to go top shelf, right? He wanted to say, oh, man is the measure of all things, right? But, but 
Elliot, the president, President Elliot wanted to go bottom shelf and say, who is man? He wanted to get low. He wanted to be humble. Wanted, who is man that you are mindful of him? In our text, the Apostle Paul goes bottom shelf. He says, do you guys remember when I first came to you? Right? He says, I, I, there was no flashy rhetoric. There was no ulterior motive. Uh, you know, I didn't come to Corinth to develop a personal following or to try and get verified with that check mark, you know, that everybody's trying to get. He said, I didn't come to you with cleverness or with gimmicks. There was no sleight of hand involved at all. I wasn't trying to please or pander to anyone. He says, when I came to you, my message was Jesus. That's it. I preached Jesus plain and simple. And this is what Paul says. You saw the power of that worked out right in front of you. Don't forget that, he says. You saw the power of that. It had its own weight. I didn't need to come with my list of degrees, Paul says. I didn't need to come with my references at all. He says, I preach Christ and him crucified. And you saw a demonstration of the Spirit's power as I did that. It had its own weight. Charles Spurgeon, a preacher from over a century ago, said the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. You just turn it loose and it will defend itself. This is what I think Paul is saying. I didn't need to add anything to this. I just preached Christ and his crucifixion, his resurrection, and it had the power to transform. You saw it yourself. And so the first weekend of this new series we're defining these bedrock principles for us as a community. And I'm saying it like this again as I've said it before. Number one on the list is Jesus is our message. Why? Number one. You, you say, why, Steve? Everybody say, why? Good. I'm about to tell you. I've got, I've got, I haven't preached. It's been, I, I missed Easter because we were all sick sitting out with COVID. And there were a couple weeks that went by. So I haven't been in front of you. So I've got 11 prints. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have 11 points, but I do have five, but they're quick, all right? Here's the number one why for why Jesus is our message. Number one, Jesus is our message because he is the way to understand God. A few summers ago, we had the event of a lifetime, we were told. People flew all from all over the world to, you know, to kind of come to different parts where you could view a total solar eclipse. How many of you guys remember this? You know, I think it was like you know, maybe five, six years ago. Uh, you know, and, and all throughout the news, they were like, oh, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. It doesn't happen for another 79 years or whatever it was. It's going to be amazing. But, but remember, they were like, don't look at the sun. You remember how they did that? Every news page. And they would say it. They would have the whole thing. Why, you know, up at five, why you can't look at the sun during the solar eclipse, right? You know, like, just don't look at it. Because, because basically it's like staring, even though you don't feel it and you can look directly at the eclipse, it's literally like staring at the sun in terms of what's happening to your eyes. So don't look at the sun because you can burn your retinas out. Don't look at it. You know, and, you know we're in, coming up, we're going to talk about why. You, and you know what people did? They looked at the sun. And then the news afterwards <laughs> was about all the people who looked at the sun and whose eyes got, you know, messed up a little bit because of that. So this is what they did. I remember because I was at a Starbucks during the time trying to do work. And then all, I was sitting outside because it was a nice day. And all of a sudden, if you remember, it got eerily dark out. And, and, and it was just about maybe three, four minutes of, of basic darkness. And I was there and I was sitting at this table. But I was like, I got to see it. I got, I got, it's a, the event of a lifetime, I'm told, you know. So I was like, I would go, so I would go. I'm like, oh, I'm not burning my eyes. And so, like, some, some kind 12-year-old near me who had already constructed his own, like, filter and whatever else, after a few minutes saw me just kind of, like, doing that, you know, and he was like, do you want to use my filter? I was like, sure, thanks, buddy. Um, and so I did. I got to see it. This is the thing. You can't look at directly at the sun without a filter. That's what they were trying to tell us. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see God telling his people, you don't get to look at my glory without dying. He says, you all cannot handle the heat that I'm bringing. <laughs> right? So God tells, Moses says, I want to see you, God. God says, tell, tell me anything you want. Moses says, I want to see you. And God says, actually, I could show myself to you, but it would kill you. <laughs> And so all you get to see, Moses says, is my, and the, the, the word in Hebrew is a really cool word. Uh, the word in Hebrew is like my afterwards. <laughs> you get to see my wake. 
right? So I'll pass by you. Don't look at me because it'll kill you, but you get to look at my wake and that'll be enough. And Moses' face, we're told, shined for, you know, in front of the people of Israel for so long. He, he had to wear a veil to cover his face so that they wouldn't see the fade and glory from him. That filter that we're talking about today is Jesus. Jesus makes the claim, and the church picked it up and said, listen, when I see Jesus, I'm actually seeing who God is through the filter that makes sense to me and that I can gaze upon to understand Jesus, Paul said, is the visible image of the invisible God. He says that in Colossians. And then he goes on to say, John, the apostle John, I want you to see this. John was his best friend. I've never mistaken my, any of my best friends, no matter how much I love and admire them, for being God. John says this. He says, when we saw Jesus, we beheld the glory of God. Jesus brings God's goodness and holiness and power into focus so that you and I can see and understand. That's why he's our message today. John 14, 9, Jesus himself says that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. In the first century, as today, the real question for Jesus' disciples was not who is Jesus. The real heart of the matter was who is God. And Jesus is the ultimate interpreter of God to you and me. That's the astonishing claim that Christianity made from the beginning. If you want to know who God the Father is, what he is like, how he operates, who he is, if you want to see his glory, you need to look no further than Jesus. That's the first reason Jesus is our message. Secondly, Jesus is our message because he's the fulfillment of every promise of God to humankind. Kind of a bold statement, but when you look at what those first followers of Jesus were claiming, that's literally what they were saying. The gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, watch me, they were written and circulated at a time when there were hundreds of eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. It wasn't a religious invention, though I think some people have tried to pass this off and say, oh, the church and all this theology about Jesus being God, it, you know, it happened later on when people were trying to justify this religious movement. But indeed, the best historical accounts that we have show that from the beginning, even in the midst of eyewitnesses, there were people claiming to have witnessed the resurrected Jesus, hundreds of them. Christianity burst onto the scene in the first century because of the belief in the resurrection of Jesus, the rescue from sin and restoration of God's, prom of God's creation that had been promised in the Old Testament, they understood that whole rescue operation was now underway. Jesus had risen from the dead. And so everything that had led up to that point was meant to set the stage for what Jesus was going to do, his victory over sin and death. It was all there. And so they're claiming, they're saying, you know what? This is a whole shift that is taking place. But everything they're saying that we believed, and the, those first followers of Jesus were the last people on earth who would have been likely to say, oh, he's God. They were the last people on earth even to have made the claims that they would have thought, but they were so convinced that they, from the beginning they began to say this. Everything God promised through the Old Testament in all of his interactions and dealings with humankind to that point was all now, every promise was fulfilled in Jesus. I found myself in some random small towns here in Illinois. Sometimes when I'm driving down I-55, I'll see exits and I'll remember, oh, I was at a high school over there one day. I, I, I landed in somebody's random kitchen with groups of students sometimes doing Bible studies or whatever. And it's, it's funny, it's a whole different existence in those parts of the state, you know. Those towns have nothing more than a stop sign and if they're really lucky, like a pizza hut or something like that or a, a, a quickie mart, you know, that they can go into and everybody kind of gathers together on Friday nights, right. But here's the beauty of it. Even if you're in that little small town way out there, every small town in our state has a road that will eventually lead up to the big city of Chicago. You can make your way there. And here's what I want you to see. In every Old Testament text, 
In every, in every text that we see in the Old Testament, there is a road that ultimately leads us to Jesus. He was the one who, who was promised to crush the serpent's head. He is the final temple where we can meet the presence of God. He's the true king who governs justly. He is the wisdom of Proverbs. He's the man after God's own heart. He's the beauty in whom every psalmist delighted. He's the resolution of every plot line in the Old Testament, the fulfillment of every hope and the complete picture of every fleeting glance that we're given. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Through him, the amen or the yes is spoken by us to the glory of God. I want you to hear this today. Every promise of God, every promise of God over your life, every potential that has been given to you by the life giver himself, all of that gets unlocked through Jesus. I, I just want you to see that. That's why, it's, that's why he's our message. We all hope for forgiveness and healing and restoration and life, these big things that are central to who we are as human beings, and they all get unlocked in Jesus because he is the yes to every promise and purpose of God for us. But here's the beauty of it. Through Jesus, Paul says, and that was him in, second, in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, because of Jesus, we get to say yes back to God. Everything in my life and in your life went south, went wrong when we said no to God. The human race is infected with this this propensity to say no to God. It's the core problem that you and I are dealing with. And Paul says, Jesus is my message. I preach Jesus and him crucified because in him every promise of God is now yes to you. But he says, here's the miracle of it. Because of that work of grace in your life, now you get to say yes back to God. And he heals that broken part of us that wants to say no. And I want you to see that when I first came to Jesus, something shifted inside of me. Something changed inside of me. And my inclination to say no to God shifted to an inclination to say yes to God. And I believe that's what happens when you and I are made new by his grace. If you haven't experienced that in your life, then I would say come back to Jesus because he can do that. Number three, Jesus is our message because his life speaks to what we lack. I'm selective these days about who I play sports with. The stakes are high when you're grown. Okay, I'll just say it like that. I say grown. Grown is, is another way of me. It's a nice way of me saying getting older, right? Um, when you're really young, your whole mindset is, man, let me get out there on the court or on the field now let me get there in the gym and let's see what I can do. I will push myself. I will, and you know that's a that's a that's a really young person's mindset. When you get a job and a family and you know your your body's not used to that sort of thing and and getting old or whatever, uh, it, it's like your mindset is, what can I do to not get injured in this be, in, you know in this activity, right? Like this is my main thing. And all the, everybody who's who's with me on this, just say a loud amen. You know what I'm talking about? You're like it's not worth it. I don't need to prove anything to you. I don't have to do that. It's not worth it. What do I have to do? I can remember when you were a kid, remember when you fall down and you would get the wind knocked out of you? And it would be like a, oh, man, I got, you know, like I remember playing soccer and that was a regular occurrence. You know, you, you get knocked down on the field, I don't know, 20, 30 times while you're playing a game, right? And sometimes the wind gets knocked you, you got to get up and run. A, today, if I fall down that hard and get the wind, it's like an ER visit for sure. It's like stop everything. I mean, even the falls that you do when you're my, they're ugly. They're, they're like when you were a kid, you would fall down and bounce back up. And when you fall like this now, it's like it's, you stay down, right? You stay down and you assess the situation. <laughs> it's for real. I don't try and get on the field with people who are, I'm, I'm happy to watch them. I'm like, you stay there and I will watch you. I don't ever want to be in a game with a pro athlete. I'm not trying to do any of that stuff. I want to be close enough to appreciate what they do, but far enough to not be compared to them. It's that way with so many people in our lives, right? Every, everybody who is excellent or talented or beautiful or, or, or just, you know, excels like to, to a degree that we can't, they, they evoke these really ambivalent feelings in us. Like we're not sure, we, on the one hand, we're kind of drawn to them because of that, right? And on the other hand, you know, they make us feel worse about ourselves, Right? 
How much more do you think that this is true in the case of infinite beauty and power and love? That's why in every place in the Bible where people get close to God, it's a traumatic event. <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like we imagine it where it's just like, oh, this is, this is so great. I just did the love. I saw butterflies and there was some violin music playing in the background. When people get close to the presence of God, it is tremendous. That's what, that's what happens when you get close to the great superlative, right? Job is talking about God for 38 chapters. You read the book of Job, he's talking about him for 38 chapters. And then God shows up. And when God shows up, Job says, I've heard of you, now, but, but now my eyes have seen you and I am undone. He says, this is, this is not what I talked about. I, oh, I spent out chopping it up with his friends, chopping it up with his other friend. He, they were doing all that. But when God shows up, Job says, I'm just laid low in the ashes. Isaiah fell on his face. He was a prophet called by God. And when he was in the presence of God, he fell on his face. And what did he say? Woe is me. It's traumatic. It was even the case. You saw it happening with Jesus. People meeting Jesus were cut to the heart. When Peter first met him, he fell at his feet. And he, Jesus has done this little, little, little miracle, and Peter falls at his feet, and he says, please go away from me because I'm a sinner. Or they didn't, if they didn't do that, they did the opposite, and they would get angry. They would get caustic. They were, like, plotting to kill him because he ruffled. They, they were just never indifferent about it. The message of the cross that Paul is talking about in our text is, is plain enough. It says, you are a sinner who is not good enough to save yourself. That's what the message of the cross is. Paul says, I preach that message over and over again. Jesus and him crucified. Because why would the Son of God need to offer himself for the sins of the world if we weren't in ourselves powerless to save us? That's why it ruffles people's feathers when, we, when you talk about that. When you see, in Jesus, you see the infinite goodness of God. And when we see that goodness on display, it requires that we throw out all of our illusions about how good we are. Right? When we see the power of God in Jesus, we have to admit we are not in control. And we are not nearly as powerful as we like to think we are. The great love that we see requires that we admit that we aren't that loving and that we are selfish to our core. The cross really is a confrontation. It means an end to our denial about all that's wrong inside of us. Let me just, I just want you to see this, the end of our pride. So Peter falls at the feet of Jesus and says, go away, I am wicked. And look at what Jesus says. He says, I know. I want you to see that. He doesn't say, no. No, oh, Peter, no, 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 no. He, he does not do that. He, says, he says, I know, follow me. And that is, in, that is the gospel right there. The same Jesus who by his goodness and his glory and his power made Peter feel more wicked than he'd ever felt before. He's now calling Peter to walk with him and to share in his mission. He values and affirms him in that way truly and deeply. That's what the message of Jesus does in people's lives. It produces a, a, a greater awareness of my own brokenness, but also a greater awareness of my value and worth to God. It's the good news that Jesus came preaching. And somebody said it like this, that I am more sinful than I dare admit, but I am more loved and valued than I dare hope. That's why Jesus is our message. Number four. Jesus is our message because he's the starting point for understanding ourselves. I don't think, that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, would never be interested in doing a, um, a reality show at our house. Um, and no one's really ever asked me, so that should also be noted. No one thinks our lives are that interesting, you know. But, but I'll, I'll give you a little window into a regular, inter, like this is a normal interaction with Jesse and myself. And we're in, in the drive through line at Portillo's. It's kind of a spur-of-the-moment decision. Um, let's, let's not try and make dinner tonight. Let's just grab some food. The kids are in the back doing what they do. And I'm now like, you know, there's always like, Portillo's really busy. There's two, two, two lines. And 
I'm looking at the menu, not like I've never seen it before, but I'm just looking at it. And she said, and so there's like kind of quiet. And I look at her and I say, um, you know, what, do you, what are you thinking? And what I mean is, what are you thinking about getting? And, and she says, well, I'm wondering what your core fears are. Well, I mean, I, I, I literally, just, I just look at, you know, the people, the cars are moving, and she's like, what are your, I just wonder what your core fears are. And I'm like, well, I, th I don't know. Right now, I think my core fear is that I'll get the, get the big beef when I re should really get the cheeseburger. <laughs> it's my current core fear. But, <laughs> you know, she's always going to go direct and deep. And so, so, like, you know, literally we had this moment. I, I had to say, you know what, I, I have to circle, we're going to have to circle back to this because, because not only is it the wrong moment in the drive through lane, but it's also, I, I don't even know. I'm still trying to understand myself. After, after all these years, I'm still trying to understand myself. If anybody is in here and says, I'm still trying to understand myself, raise your hand and let me know that you're figuring it out. Okay, good. Because this is, I think, one of the things about age is, is that I've observed is it's not that we become better. We just become more sophisticated pretenders. And so my hope is that when we come, if, if, uh, if, if there be any place in our lives where we would be ourselves, that it would be here to throw out the, 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 the costumes that we wear of I'm, gonna, I'm a successful business person or, you know, I'm a very, you know, I'm a, I'm a you know, wonderful, um, talented, career-oriented individual. You know, like all of the costumes that we wear that make us feel better about ourselves but that aren't really true to the core. One person at church, one person at school, one person at work, one person at the club. But here's what the Bible says. When you become a Christian, you take off all those costumes and you put on Christ. That's what it says. Paul says, when I came to you, I came boldly but humbly. Right? That's a rare combination. It's common... To have one or the other, right? People who, are, you know, if my validation comes from how well I perform and how much people like me or any other outside metric, then when things are good, then I'm bold, right? But you know what I'm not probably is I'm not really that humble because in the end, I'm really feeling great. I did it. I built this, this little empire of my own. Or let's say this, when things are really bad and I realize that I've messed up and I feel that I see people... People come to church all the time in this moment in their lives. And, oh, I realize. And they come humbly, right? But they're it's, like, it's almost like there's never that combination of boldness there because they just feel terrible about themselves because their reference point is their performance and their success. It's a rare combination, Paul says, that I could have self-awareness and humility but also have boldness and love. That's what the gospel does. That's what the message of Jesus does. I, I, I love this. This is just a, a little, uh, you know, thing that I, I, I think I might have read somewhere, but it's kind of stuck with me for years. The progression that Paul goes through when you notice this. If you understand the timing of Paul, the Apostle Paul's letters, right, the guy who wrote this text. 1 Corinthians, I mentioned, was one of the earliest letters that Paul wrote. And in this letter, uh, in chapter 15, he says, I am the least of the apostles. And he's talking about it, he says, because I was one who persecuted the church, and, you know, I came after all of them, and they were all there, and I was kind of one, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, abnormally born, you know, just kind of way late. You know, I was like that oops child of God, you know, where I, the oops apostle, you know, where God was like, oh, you know, yeah, you, I'm, I'm going to. And Paul says, I'm the least of all the apostles. But these are the big guys, right? These are the folks that are, you know, chosen by God to establish the church. He says, I'm the least of them. But then, if you go to Ephesians that he writes later on, midway through his missionary career. And then, in chapter 3, Paul says, I'm the least of the saints. Right? He's all these people of God. He says, I'm the least of them. But then, if you take it to 1 Timothy, which is one of his latest letters that he writes, in chapter 1, he says, I'm not just the least of the apostles. I'm not just the least of the saints. He says, I'm the chief of sinners. The longer that Paul is walking with Jesus, the longer that Paul's life is being, you know, kind of 
interacting with the message, the good news, the gospel about what Jesus has done, the more humble Paul gets. But if you look at the end of his life, he's also more bold than he's ever been before, right? At the end of his life there, right in Timothy, he says, I've run the race that God has given. I'm ready to die. He says, you put it out there for me, I'm willing to do it. He is more bold than he's ever been, but he is more humble than he's ever been before. And that combination comes when I accept and receive the message of Jesus. You see, the woman or the man of God who is full of themselves can never proclaim a Christ who emptied himself. That was what Jesus did. Romans 13, 14 says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ like we said if God wants to build you up before you can be built God is going to need to work on that humility you need to get the cornerstone set right in your life every stone in those ancient buildings it says that Jesus was the cornerstone every stone was laid in reference to that cornerstone everything was built upon that there's something special about being around people whose cornerstone is Jesus. You can be around people who are Christian and they may have like their thing. They might have their, their, their they might have their thing that their cause, I would say they're, 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 they're rallying around a cause. Let me just say this because there's, everybody's got a cause these days. And there are, there are people who are rallied around a cause and it can be a good cause. I'm not, I mean, if it's a bad cause, then forget about it. But I'm saying, you could be rallied around a good cause, a worthy cause, even a Christian cause. But if that, that, even though that cause might be good, it shouldn't be cornerstone for you. It's not what you're building everything on. And you can tell the difference. I can tell the difference being around somebody for just a little while. All right, what's your cornerstone? Is it this cause? Is it this thing? As good as it may be, is your cornerstone Jesus? If it's not, then the building is going to be off kilter. You see, the problem with good causes is that they can get ruined by bad people. So you can have a good cause, but if you're not built on the cornerstone of Jesus, then all of your own flaws are going to infect your view and your approach and all the things that you, when you're built on Jesus, that humility is going deeper and deeper and deeper, working in your life to keep that, to keep you rooted in the things that really matter. Because a love for good things disconnected from a love from God will in time get twisted just like everything else. Self-awareness and love. That's why we preach. Because Jesus helps us understand ourselves better than anybody else. And lastly, Jesus is our message because he's a rescue for sinners. I mean, I'll tell you why we planted the church. We're going to have step one today. And one of my windows in there is to talk about why, why do we plant New City Church. That's my assignment. But I'm going to give it to you right now. It's because... We want to preach Jesus. And we want to join all those other wonderful churches who are preaching Jesus. And we want to do in our own way. We want to reach those that God has given us to reach. And we want to help people to become followers of Jesus. And we want to do this. We want to do this because the message of Jesus is a rescue for sinners like me and like you. We've just experienced a 95 degree springtime in Chicago. <laughs> And the kids are now officially ready for pools to open. Our kids are like, is the pool open? What? Can we go to the pool today? Our oldest, Ava, she's just learned. She's pretty good. She's learning how to swim. She's got it where we can take the floaties off. But it's a terrifying experience for me. She's at that stage where it looks, all, it looks like pure survival to me. She's having a great time. But she's like, her head is just bobbing under. And this is the thing. I am ready at any moment. My eyes are locked on her at every moment because if she goes under, I'm ready for the rescue. <laughs> right? This is what Paul said to the Galatian church. He said, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. Paul is saying that the whole Jesus operation was a rescue operation. It wasn't Jesus coming to show us a better way. It wasn't Jesus coming to instruct us as a moral teacher or as a wonderful example. Though he was all of those things and so much more. Paul says this was really a rescue operation. And the way I want to see this, people who want to make Jesus... and. 
I want to make Jesus something besides a savior for sinners, people who want to make him a good teacher or make him into a, 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 you know, a, a wonderful leader who started a movement that changed the world. People who want to make him nothing more than that are denying this important truth about him, that he was sent to rescue sinners. He was not sent, he was not sent to give instructions to us in the same way that if we, we encounter a drowning person, it is not the moment to say, Hang on, let me show you how to do breaststroke. Right, what you got to do is you got to put your face in the water. I don't even know this is breaststroke. What is this? This is breaststroke, right? <laughs> freestyle, freestyle, freestyle. Let me show you how to do freestyle because I don't even know how to describe breaststroke. <laughs> Here's how you do freestyle. You, you put your head in the water and then when, when, you, when you come up, that is not the moment they're drowning. <laughs> This is what I want you to see. Religion is us giving instructions to a drowning person. That's all it is. It's the wrong. Listen, if somebody comes to me and says, let me tell you how to be a better person. Let me show you how you can get right. Let me show you how I can, let's tinker with this and you can be better. And this is the prevailing view in our world today that if we just work hard enough and if we just have the right information. You see, people are bad because they don't have the right information. And it denies this core truth that you and I are drowning because of sin. Jesus is our message because he is a rescue for sinners. God doesn't shout instructions at us from a, a distance. He doesn't say, listen, hey, here's what you got to do. He didn't do that. He said, I am injecting myself into the situation. I'm jumping in with them and I will rescue them. Now later on, you can learn to swim, but you got to be rescued first. Researchers say that the average person makes 1.7 million decisions in a lifetime. 1.7 million. It's kind of like the, the big beef versus the cheeseburger decision, right? That's one of them. But there are others that are way more important than that. And this one decision, what you do with Jesus, is the most important decision. The most significant and consequential decision of your life is going to be, what do I do with Jesus? Do I receive this message of Jesus as a rescue for me, for my sin, or do I reject it? That's the most consequential decision that you and I will make. And folks, we are a product of our decisions, not our circumstances alone. What you do with Jesus so important because somebody else said it like this eternity is too long to be wrong that's why it's the most important one i'm going to invite you to bow your head with me for just a moment we understand god because of jesus we see that the fears that we have of a god who doesn't love us are all kind of pushed to the side because jesus at, the, at his own cost, left his own glory to come to you and I it, it, to rescue us from our sin. If you're here today and you say, man, Steve, I need to respond. I need to make that decision today to receive God's forgiveness, God's rescue from my sin. And I want you to pray with me. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand. And before we go today, right now in this moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray uh, together with everybody here. Thank you. Is there another hand? If that's you, you say, I just want, I, I need to be included in that prayer. I need to be, I need to be right with God. If that's you, you say, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I'm going to wait one second longer just because I want to give an opportunity for you to respond. There's something that happens in, in our lives, in our hearts when we respond. Praise God. I want you to repeat after me, everybody in the house, if you've been with us for a long time, you know that we do this right here. We pray together, and this is not just a prayer. This is a, a, a confession, and so I want you to confess this together. I want you to speak it out loud. Say, Dear Jesus, I believe... You are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my guilt, and my shame, and you died for it. 
you faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's put our hands together for these two and anybody else online who today prayed that prayer. I, I, I pray. Listen, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And so if you have received that gift of life today, then you have a reason to celebrate. And we're going to stand together. I am declaring today, this is the New City Summer Jam. It literally is the song that I've been waiting to sing. Actually, I don't want to sing it. I want Celeste to sing it for us. And we're going to rejoice together in Jesus. Stand to your feet today. And before we go, we're going to celebrate Jesus whose name is above every name, who is greater than our sin, who is greater than death, who defeated every power that was against us, and now the Bible says is for us, not against us. Praise God. Put your hands together and let's sing this together. He is greater than. He is greater than. He is greater than. We're just going to celebrate how great he is. There is no one greater than he is. Hallelujah. There's no one stronger, no one wiser. We live we have found and declared that there is no one like our God. Can you put your hands together like this? Hey. I've seen many places and many faces I've come to know. Hey. Times I've celebrated, sweet drink I've tasted, they come and go. But there was a treasure poured without measure over the earth. Yeah. A light that's so bright it outshines the brightest lights of the world. We say, no greater friend I know. Hey. No greater peace I know. You can keep them hands together. Hey, hey. No one more forgiving, no one more healing, no one more true. Come on, if you got it by now, will you sing it out? Your love is a treasure poured without measure over the earth. Hey, he is a light that's so bright, it outshines the bright.
feel it? It's the Summer Jam 2022. I mean, you're going to hear it a lot, so get used to it, all right? And that call and response, if you don't know about that, then you better get with it because it's just the greatest, right? All right, here's the thing. I'm going to pray blessing over you. Keep those hands going. And then we're going to sing you out. Is that okay if we That's sing them out? Right. Okay, here we go. Let's pray. Lord, bless your people today. We praise Jesus, who is our life, who has loved us with an undying love. I praise you, Lord, today that we are a Jesus people. Now let us go and represent to our world who it is that we follow. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Come on, put those hands together. You can go when you need to, but she's going to lead us. I'm going to stay up here with you. Come on, we're going to 